let's close in prayer. And why don't you go ahead and grab your notes out of your handout, and uh, it really is such an honor to be with you today. It's so fun to gather the, the, the whole Overlake family together. If you're joining us online, uh, uh, we love that as well. In fact, I want to give a shout out to my friend Clint, who joins us online from Arkansas every single week, and so yeah, we love you, Clint. Hey, um, we've been going through a series, and it's called Living the Dream. And it, we've been really un unwrapping and, and kind of delving into what is this thing that's true about us, that we have these dreams, that, we, that we, um, they, they just press into us, that they stir within us. And today's message is on a daydream, okay? We're talking about daydreaming. And the definition of daydreaming is that pleasant vision. It's, it's a, a usually a wishful creation of the imagination. And so this is a perfect day for us to, uh, to just think about maybe a, a little boy laying out on, on a football field and just dreaming about what it might be to someday play in the Super Bowl. Amen. You could imagine two brothers doing exactly the same thing. Siblings dreaming about what it might be to someday play in the Super Bowl. And I just want to tell you, um, I, I don't have to imagine what it's like to be an older brother whose younger brother is taller and more athletic and better looking than you are. So I'm cheering for the Ravens today, just so you know. Go John, right? And, and so, um, but just that idea of daydreams, that, that glorious haunting that, that sweeps us off our feet. And, and what we've done in these last couple weeks is we've looked at dreams and the way God speaks through dreams. We've talked about how God is the original dreamer and that his dreams become reality. And we dream, you and I, we have dreams that stir within us because we are made in his image. And when our dreams become reality, when our dreams Dreams are fulfilled, he's the one who gets the glory. And so all of that is sort of background for what we're talking about this morning. But what I want to do is I want us to take a look at what is it that our, our daydreams are propelling us into and where might our dreams and life circumstance and God's glory all intersect. And today I have uh, the sneaking suspicion that some of you might be in need of a pep talk. And so I want to begin today's message with just a little pep talk. Go ahead and watch this video. I think we all need a pep talk. The world needs you to stop being boring. Yeah, you. Boring is easy. Everybody can be boring, but you're good at that. Life is not a game, people. Life isn't a cereal either. Well, it is a cereal. And if life is a game, aren't we on the same team? I mean, really, right? I'm on your team, be on my team. This is life, people. You got air coming through your nose. You got heartbeat. That means it's time to do something. A poem. Two roads diverged in the woods, and I took the road less traveled. And it hurt, man! Really bad. Rocks, forms, and glass. Wah! Not cool, Robert Frost. Well, if there really were two paths, I won't be in the one that leads to awesome. It's like that dude Journey said, don't stop believing unless you dream stupid. Then you should get a better dream. I think that's how it goes. Well, Michael Jordan have quit. Well, he did quit. So he retired. Yeah, yes, he retired. But before that, in high school, well, if he had quit when he didn't make the team, he would have never made Space Jam. And I love Space Jam. What will be your Space Jam? What will you create will make the world awesome? Nothing if you keep sitting there. That's why I'm talking to you today. This is your time. This is my time. It's our time. We can make every day better for each other. But if we're all on the same team, let's start acting like it. We got work to do. We can cry about it or we can dance about it. We were made to be awesome. Let's get out there. I don't know everything, I'm just a kid. But I do know this. It's everybody's duty to give the world a reason to dance. So get to it.
just been pep talked. <laughs> if there are two roads, he says, I want to be on the road that leads to awesome. Uh, what a great thing for us to think about. What, what a great way for us to phrase the conversation of our dreams. And, and what I want to do today, because I, I do believe that the, the roads diverge, but today I want to propel you towards the one who will make your life awesome. I, I want to push you toward the one who loves you, the one who created you, the one who will plant dreams within your life and allow your life to be not only your very, very best, but the one that brings him the most glory, the one that brings his kingdom here on earth. I, I want you to encounter the living Lord of the universe and find out that he's awesome and that when you're intimate with him, you're awesome as well. And so here's what I want you to do. You see the scripture there, Psalm 34, verse eight. It says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Would you just circle the word taste? We're gonna come back to this. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, the joys of those who take refuge in him. And at some point, each of us are, are going to need to make this decision that we're going to that we're going to taste that that we're going to walk this road that that the road that we walk, we say, you know what, I have tasted and I have seen that God is good, and when I do take refuge in Him, I find that there is lasting joy that comes from that intimacy, and so all of this has something to do with our dreams, and it, it leads us to this first question. The question is really really simple. It's are we willing to allow God to sculpt our dreams? Are we willing to let God sculpt our dreams? Do we trust him with our dreams? Do we trust God that much? I'm not asking if you understand God completely. That's never gonna happen in this lifetime. We're finite. Our intellects are finite. He's infinite. We're never gonna get our arms totally around him. But the question is, do we trust that God's perspective is bigger than ours? Do we trust that the author of life has more knowledge about life than you and I know even about our own lives? Do we trust the creator with our dreams? Are we humble enough to allow him to take our dreams and to sculpt them? And this is what God says. Again, we're in Psalm 32 here, verse eight. The Lord says, I will guide you along the best pathway for your life. I will advise you and watch over you. And I wanna spend just a moment kind of picking that verse apart. The first thing you need to see is that there is a best road for you. There is a greatest pathway. The, the roads do diverge. God knows the very best road, the journey that involves God's glory and your best. And, and he knows what road that is. And the scripture says he wants to guide you along that road. Now, the, what the scripture also intimates is that his care for us is both distant and removed. In other words, he's over the entire universe, but it's also active and involved. He's personally advising us and guiding us along our journey. And the tools that he uses to guide us, and we talk about this often at Overlake, he uses a scripture, he uses our loving and believing friends. That's why we do life in community. He uses our conscience or our gut Right? He uses his spirit in our lives, and he uses life circumstance. All these things God uses to guide us on the best pathway for our lives. And if you're reading through Psalm 32, you come to verse 9. And verse 9 says, don't be like a horse that needs a bit and bridle to be led and guided. In other words, the encouragement is that you would actually be really open to listening to God. You'd be really open to trusting him with your dreams. You, you would be actively getting your life in a posture where we're, you're ready to listen and you're ready to respond and you're ready to obey. As he says, this is the way, you say, I want to walk in it. Okay, so all of these things are encouragements from scripture and they're encouragements surrounding our dreams. Because if we really do trust God with our dreams, if we really will be open to trusting him and allowing him to sculpt our dreams, then what he does, he delights in pouring fuel on the fire. See, God's spirit is like lighter fluid on the flame of our dream life. And you wanna write that down, that's uh, copy mark. <laughs> copy, uh, I, 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 every time I write something, I want you to know how proud I am that I wrote something, so. <laughs> 
but, but look what the scripture says. This is the Holy Spirit's work in our life, okay? This is in Acts 2.17. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. See, this is the place where we're at. This is God's spirit pouring into our life, the source of our dreams. And, and he's pouring out beautiful daydreams in all of us, regardless of your generation, regardless of your gender, regardless of your ethnicity. God's spirit is being poured out over all who are open to receiving his dreams for us. This is powerful news for dreamers because it means that we need to hold things in kind of a dynamic tension. And if you're filling in the blanks, the first one really simply is that we need to first find joy where we are. We need to be content. And I would just describe to you how impossible this is unless you've tasted and seen that the Lord is good. But once you have tasted and seen that the Lord is good, then you realize how kind he is and how gracious he is, how loving he is, how wonderful he is for you, how he delights as a father delights in a child. That's how he delights in you. And when we rest in him and walk with him, then we'll be more likely to being open to contentment, to living in joy right where we are in our current circumstances. Now, the Bible also gives us these sort of challenges, right? And so you have to take all these things and work them together. You've got to hold them. But Ecclesiastes 6.9 says, Enjoy what you have rather than desiring what you don't have. Again, be content. Just dreaming about nice things is meaningless like chasing the wind. Have you ever met somebody who's always telling you what they're going to do, what they're going to do, what they're going to be? how next year is going to go differently than this year. It's, it's sort of always out in the future. And, and what this is saying is, is that kind of framework where you're always daydreaming about these fantasies, it's like chasing the wind. It's not accomplishing anything. It's not doing anything. And, and uh, they're, never, they're never moving toward a dream. They're never maximizing the moments that they've been given. And, and really, that's the key. That's why you need to be content with where you are and content with who you are. And that contentment only comes with your intimacy with Jesus. You've tasted and seen that he's good. You, you know who you are. You're his son. You're his daughter. You're the beloved of most high God. And so you can be content in your identity. You can be content within that intimacy. And so you're driving to work, you know, your commute to work, and you're humming a tune, and you don't know where that's coming from. It's coming from your relationship with God. You're paying your bills. You've got this joy spilling out. You're like paying bills. You're joyful. How is that? It's because you're content to be with the Lord, right? And you kind of just run through it. Situations where people are like, why are you so content? Why are you so peace-filled? Well, that, that peace is only available through your relationship with Christ. So that's where this whole thing starts, is you got to realize it starts with being content. It starts with, with recognizing, oh yeah, Jesus, you're right here with me. I, I get to walk this life with you. In my relationships, I get to see your love. My friendships, I see you right in the midst of this. With my spouse, I see that you're present here. And so you can be content in all these things. Not that life is perfect, but that you can be content because you're walking with Jesus. You've tasted and seen that he's good. But you got to hold that in dynamic tension because this next thing is also true. We must strive toward dream fulfillment. In other words, the challenge is that we would also be discontent. And so often what God does is he uses our daydreams to propel us into making things better. And over like we've talked about this before, how you have been given influence in your world. You have been given a domain. You have been given, whatever that looks like, wherever it is that you live, whatever relationships you've been given, wherever it is that you work, wherever you go to school, you have a domain. And when you dream about bettering that domain, that is a form of divine discontent. And it's a beautiful thing. And so you recognize that God wants to use you, his son, his daughter. He wants to use his family to make things better. Not just make them better, but to literally bring his kingdom here on earth. We talked last week about how 
we can default on our dreams. And I said something, and, and I believe it's true. I said that one of the primary reasons that God hates sin is because sin steals our dreams, and God loves us too much to see that happen. And I believe that's true. It, it is true. Sin steals our dreams, but it's not the only thing. And so if you want to write down a, a couple of other things and, and just see if they're in your life as well, it's not only sin that will steal our dreams, but fear will steal our dreams. Impatience will steal our dreams. Laziness has nothing to do with dream fulfillment, and yet we recognize it can steal our dreams away. And so the scripture tells us in Colossians 3, we're to work willingly at whatever we do. Work willingly at whatever you do, as though you were working for the Lord rather than people. What that verse means is it's important not to let your dreams keep you in a dreamlike state. Your dreams are to propel you to actions. You, you work at them and you realize that dreaming uh, is a good activity and there's a lot of positive just coming from dreaming. But if it never moves to action, then it's always going to be unfulfilled. And so this balance that we strike to recognize it's okay for me to be okay with where I am. I'm content in my relationship with the Lord, but then to also be discontent, which causes us to strive toward our dream fulfillment. And I recognize it lives in a dynamic tension, and we're going to have to really wrestle with what that looks like as it plays itself out in our lives. But I want to show you a video now of, um, it's, it's a situation in which you'll see someone was forced to walk that road and, and to walk the road living in that dynamic tension. So go ahead and watch this. If your life were a book, and you were the author, how would you want your story to go? That's the question that changed my life forever. Growing up in the hot Las Vegas desert, all I wanted was to be free. I would daydream about traveling the world, living in a place where it snowed, and I would picture all of the stories that I would go on to tell. At the age of 19, the day after I graduated high school, I moved to a place where it snowed. For the first time in my life, I felt free, independent, and completely in control of my life. I went home from work early one day with what I thought was the flu, and less than 24 hours later, I was in the hospital on life support with less than a 2% chance of living. It wasn't until days later, as I lay in a coma, that the doctors diagnosed me with bacterial meningitis, a vaccine-preventable blood infection. Over the course of two and a half months, I lost my spleen, my kidneys, the hearing in my left ear, and both of my legs below the knee. When my parents wheeled me out of the hospital, I felt like I had been pieced back together like a patchwork doll. I thought the worst was over until weeks later when I saw my new legs for the first time. The calves were bulky blocks of metal with pipes bolted together for the ankles, and a yellow rubber foot with the raised rubber line from the toe to the ankle to look like a vein. I didn't know what to expect, but I wasn't expecting that. With my mom by my side and tears streaming down our faces, I strapped on these chunky legs <laughs> and I stood up. They were so painful and so confining that all I could think was, how am I ever going to travel the world in these things? How was I ever going to live the life full of adventure and stories as I always wanted? And how was I going to snowboard again? That day, I went home, I crawled into bed, and this is what my life looked like for the next few months. Me passed out, escaping from reality, 
with my legs resting by my side. I was absolutely, physically, and emotionally broken. It was this moment that I asked myself that life-defining question. If my life were a book and I were the author, how would I want this story to go? And I began to daydream. I daydreamed like I did as a little girl. And I imagined myself walking gracefully, helping other people through my journey. Four months later, I was back up on a snowboard, although things didn't go quite as expected. My knees and my ankles wouldn't bend, and at one point, I traumatized all the skiers on the chairlift when I, <laughs> I fell, and my legs, still attached to my snowboard, <laughs> went flying down the mountain. <laughs> so discouraged, but I knew that if I could find the right pair of feet, that I would be able to do this again. And this is when I learned that our borders and our obstacles can only do two things. One, stop us in our tracks, or two, force us to get creative. I did a year of research, still couldn't figure out what kind of legs to use, couldn't find any resources that could help me, so I decided to make a pair myself. My leg maker and I put random parts together, and we made a pair of feet that I could snowboard in. It was these legs and the best 21st birthday gift I could ever receive, a new kidney from my dad, that allowed me to follow my dreams again. I started snowboarding, then I went back to work, then I went back to school, then in 2005 I co-founded a nonprofit organization for youth and young adults with physical disabilities so they could get involved with action sports. And just this past February, I won two back-to-back -back World Cup gold medals. <laughs> which made me the highest ranked adaptive female snowboarder in the world. And although today is about innovation without borders, I have to say that in my life, innovation has only been possible because of my borders. I've learned that Borders are where the actual ends, but also where the imagination and the story begins. So the thought that I would like to challenge you with today is that maybe instead of looking at our challenges and our limitations as something negative or bad, we can begin to look at them as blessings. Magnificent gifts that can be used to ignite our imaginations and help us go further than we ever knew we could go. It's not about breaking down borders. It's about pushing off of them and seeing what amazing places they might bring us. That's uh, powerful. It's powerful, and, and one of the reasons why we show that is obviously for inspiration, because so often as humans, what we do is we write ourselves off. We just think, ah, it's, the story's over for me. I, I, it can't be that, that God wants me to dream these kind of dreams, you know? I'm, I'm too old, I'm 42, I can't dream anything, or, oh, you know, I just, I just don't have the, the kind of energy I used to have, you know? Or, you know what, I've got a, I've got a word on my pinky, and I can't... Uh, and then you see a story like that, oh, no legs, oh, you make legs, oh, you snowboard, oh, you're the best in the world, oh, okay, all right, uh, well, I guess I can dream, you know, like, uh, it's fantastic, right? And, and you recognize, oh, I get it, I get it, I get it, I get it. So I'm to be content in my relationship with the Lord, I've tasted and seen, and so I, I draw all kinds of strength and reserve and, and identity and peace from my relationship with God. And that doesn't cause me to do nothing, it propels me to do everything. 
And so now I can strive and I can go hard and I can give this incredible energy to my dreams. Why? Because I'm content in who I am in the Lord. That allows me to go forward. You know, the scripture says that with faith, all things are possible. It never says with faith, all things are easy. And so we have to recognize, right, that we hold these things in dynamic tension. And this is how God uses these, the, these things that we try to balance in tension to propel us into the greatest life that we could possibly live. The life with the most adventure, the most kingdom impact, our best life, and the one that brings him the most glory. So all of this is what God's up to. Now, we've been taking a look at some dreams in Scripture, and I want to take a look at one more as we close today. It's the dream that Peter had. Now, Peter is one of the disciples. Peter had a dream when he was with Jesus, and the dream was that, that, that Jesus was going to establish an earthly kingdom and that he was going to take Jerusalem as the seat, of the capital of his kingdom, and Jesus was going to be installed as the king of this kingdom, and all the disciples would be sort of the right hands, the governors, the lieutenants, etc. They'd all get a place in the cabinet, and that was the dream that the disciples had. But then this thing happened called the crucifixion. And so they had to surrender that dream. And then a couple of days later, this thing happened called the resurrection. Christ, no longer dead. They'd seen him killed. Now he's alive. And he's commissioning them, right? He's releasing them to go into all the world. So now the disciples had to be free to let Jesus sculpt their dreams. They thought they had a dream. They did have a dream before, but it wasn't the, the dream that was going to happen so they had to offer this thing to Jesus and let him sculpt their dreams. And, and so what I want to do is I want to tell you a story. It's found in Acts chapter 10. It's on your notes. It'll, it, it, it'll be in your Bible if you want to open that up. Uh, and uh, Acts chapter 10, it's on the screen as well. But here's the deal. This happens. This is an actual daydream. Okay, it happens at noon. Peter's dreaming. And, and he's dreaming on the roof of Simon the Tanner's house in Joppa. Now, I've been there. I want to tell you it's beautiful, right? He was up on the rooftop like a patio looking out of the Mediterranean. I would love to daydream there. Like that would be a beautiful thing. And so this is where Peter is when the story begins. And so again, let's take a look at this. It says, the next day as Cornelius' messengers were nearing the town, and you can just caveat that for a moment. We'll, we'll go back to that. Peter went up to the flat roof to pray. It was about noon and he was hungry. What's interesting about that detail is that God will often use the circumstances that you are in, your immediate situation, to speak through in order for him to sculpt your dreams. So check this out. Peter's hungry, and now he starts to dream. Okay? But while a meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw the sky open, and something like a large sheet was let down by its four corners. In the sheet were all kinds of animals, reptiles, and birds. Then a voice said to him, Peter, or get up, Peter, kill, and eat them. No, Lord, Peter declared. I've never eaten anything that our Jewish laws had declared un impure and unclean. But the voice spoke again. Do not call something unclean if God has made it clean. The same vision was repeated three times. Then the sheet was suddenly pulled up to heaven. Okay. So Peter has a dream, and literally, it is a dream of God saying, I've got a smorgasbord of food for you to eat. I've got a Las Vegas buffet for you to eat, all right? It's got everything on it. Go ahead, taste and see, Peter. It's good. But Peter says, no. Uh, he's, a, he's a good Jewish boy. And all kinds of things that were in that sheet were uh, off limits for the, the Jewish culture and the Jewish heritage and the Jewish law. So you can't eat certain things. You, you know, you can't eat the shellfish or the cloven hoof and all this stuff. And, and so Peter said, no, 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 I've never done anything like that. I've never had anything impure and unclean. And then the message, don't call it unclean if God has made it clean. Okay, so that's the dream. So let's see what happens next. Peter was very perplexed. Maybe that's how you're feeling right now. Peter was very perplexed. What could the vision mean? Just then, the men sent by Cornelius found Simon's house. Standing outside the gate, they asked if a man named Simon Peter was staying there. Okay. So what has happened that Peter does not know is that there's a man named Cornelius, lives up in Caesarea. And he has had a vision from the Lord that he's supposed to pursue Peter. 
okay? And so he sends his men down to find Peter. What you, what you need to understand about Cornelius, he's a Gentile. Uh, that means he's, he's not a Jewish person outside of the Jewish nation, outside of the Jewish religion. And so um, this is a big deal. A Gentile is, is looking to find Peter, the disciple, okay? So we keep going. Meanwhile, as Peter was puzzling over the vision, the Holy Spirit said to him, the three men have come looking for you. Get up, go downstairs, and go with them without hesitation. Don't worry, for I have sent them. So Peter went down and said, I'm the man you're looking for. Why have you come? They said, we are sent by Cornelius, a Roman officer. He's a devout and God-fearing man, well-respected by all the Jews. A holy angel came or instructed him to summon you to his house so that he can hear your message. So Peter invited the men to stay for the night. The next day he went with them, accompanied by some of the brothers from Joppa. They arrived in Caesarea the following day. Cornelius was waiting for them and had called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter entered his home, Cornelius fell at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter pulled him up and said, stand up. I am a human being just like you. I have to say this all the time to people. Um, <laughs> just uh, come on, you know, like, let's be bros, you know, like, uh, no, just kidding. Never, ever once happened. So they talked together and went inside where many others were assembled. Peter told them, you know, it's against our laws for a Jewish man to enter a Gentile home like this or to associate with you. But God has shown me that I should no longer think of anyone as impure or unclean. So I came without objection as soon as I was sent for. Now, tell me why you sent for me. It begins a dialogue. By the way, if you keep reading in that chapter, you see that Cornelius and all of his household accept Christ as Lord. So let me do a quick recap for you. A couple weeks ago, we started with the dream of Jacob. Jacob had a dream in which God declared to him, I will be with you and I will bless you. And he did. Then we took a look the next week at Joseph. Joseph was Jacob's son. Joseph had a dream, and Joseph thought his dream was that he would rule over his brothers, but really it was the dream of God that he would save the nation of Israel. It was a part of how God was choosing a nation. And now we have Peter's dream, and what Peter's dream is, my love is for the entire world. My love is not limited to one person, and it is not limited to one people it is for the entire world. And so you see the progression here of God giving his dreams to his people, sculpting the dreams if, if we will allow him to. And what Peter's dream means, of course, is that you and I are invited, right? All of us are included because we, most of us in here, maybe not all, but most of us are, we're Gentiles, just like Cornelius. Uh, God chose a nation, Israel, to birth a son, Jesus, so that the entire world could be saved. That's you and me. All non-Jewish folk are referred to in the scripture as Gentiles, and that means most of us fall into that category. So because Peter actually stepped across the threshold of Cornelius' house, right, just that small step across the doorframe and began to associate with the Gentile, now you and I are suddenly included in God's plan. What is amazing to me when you think about any movement, you need to understand it always starts with one person, and very honestly, it always starts with one step. And what I want you to see in this moment is that, that that step was taken when Peter crossed the threshold into Cornelius' house. This was before Paul ever preached to the Gentiles. One of the thoughts I had this week was maybe Peter's first step was the catalyst Paul needed to begin to become the, the apostle to the Gentiles. Of course, everyone knows Paul. Paul is the one who preached to the nations. But would he have done so? Had he not had this permission-giving step of Peter as he crossed the threshold of Cornelius' house, it was against his law. The Jewish law said you do not cross into a Gentile's home. You don't cross even into their cities. You don't enter into their home. You don't eat at table with them. All kinds of rules. No, no, no. They are not chosen. They are not clean. They are impure. Stay away. And what Peter did, was what his dream instructed him to do. God said, do not call anything unclean that I 
have declared clean. And so Peter took this incredible, you know he had every reason not to, right? He could have blown off the daydream. Ah, oh, it's just a daydream. I was hungry. I was, you know, I was, uh, obviously I was dreaming about food because I was hungry and it was, you know, that wasn't God. That was digestion, right? He had every reason to blow it off. He had every religious reason to blow it off. But he chose to follow Jesus over religion. That's what we keep coming back to again and again. No, we want to follow Jesus. And so Peter's dream, which actually was Jesus' dream, was that the entire world would be included. Peter realized that God's dream was to save the entire world, that his dream was not about exclusivity, but it was about inclusivity. It was not about the exaltation of a single nation, but it was about the calling of all the nations of the world. It was not about a hierarchy where the weak serve the strong. It was about a monarchy where the king serves the people. And if Peter never would have taken that step, you and I never would have been included. But thank God for Peter's dream. And thank God that you and I are the recipients of that dream. So Peter's dream means, of course, that you're invited and that I'm invited, that everyone's invited, of course, and, and that no one is to be written off, that everyone is to be loved and accepted and welcomed. And this is no matter what nationality or ethnicity, no matter what lifestyle choice or addiction or brokenness, no matter how loudly that they proclaim a disbelief in a God they find distasteful. You see, the dream of Peter, sculpted by Christ himself, is that we are to go and love, to go and share, to go and give, and not let any lines of discrimination or judgment prevent us from tasting and seeing that the Lord is good, even there, even in the heart that you find least likely to accept God's love even in the place where you find there's no way I will experience God's presence in that place or with that group or in that tribe or in that country, God says, taste and see. Peter, go and eat. And so Peter's dream is an invitation. Not only that Peter would taste and see and find that the Lord is so good, that he is all good, but it was a dream that now you and I can dream. And that we can recognize, no, no, that's the dream that Christ has for us as well. And that we're called to go and to share and to go and to love and to go and to serve and to go and to give. This is, this is a dream that's now birthed on, on our hearts. And, and we're not to write any group off. We're not, we're not to run any group down. We're not, we're not to do it. You know, the deal is just go and taste and see that the Lord is good. Go and eat. Don't, don't declare anything unclean that God has declared clean. So practically, what this means is, you know, um, missions, right? Uh, go, right? The whole world. And, and that's the great God, Jesus saying, hey, go into all the world. Baptize, make disciples, teach them to obey everything I command. Just go. Don't write any world, any place in the world off. Don't write any continent off. Don't write any country off. Don't write any tribe off. Like the entire world on limits, right? Not off limits, on limits. I just made that phrase up. Is that a phrase? I don't know. On limits, I, doesn't make any sense. So that's a practical thing, and a lot of you are involved in missions, but you know where else you find this? In your workplace today. It's so easy to, to write off the super snarky, uber intellectual, educated beyond all common sense person in the work spot, and, and yet God loves that person, and God invites you to communicate love to that person it's super easy to, to, to write off, uh, for, you know the brokenness that exists, you know the addictions that are out there, and just say, oh, God, there's no way that they're included. But they are. And God loves them, and he, he loves every man and every woman and every child. He loves the street kids. He loves the homeless folks. He loves every single person. God so specifically loves, and he calls you to have the same dream that he gave to Peter. Taste and see. Go and eat. And don't declare it unclean. If I've declared it clean. Another place that you see this practically speaking is right here at Overlake. Friends, I gotta tell you, it is so fun to get the whole family together. It really is. But I wanna tell you, I don't know how much more we can do this. You guys are growing too big. You're getting too big. And, and so what happens is our children's ministry just bursts at the seams. 
We, just, we don't have room, right? Not only do we not have room, we don't have leaders. I, I need you. I, I need you to say, you know what? As a part of dreaming Peter's dream, I will give my time so that I can invest in a child, so that I can invest in a youth, so that I can invest and celebrate recovery, so that I can invest at Overlake. Why? Because this is where the dream's being lived out. So it's a practical way that, that you can walk in the stream. And, and so the, the thing that I want you to understand is over like you're already, so many of you, you're already dreaming this kind of dream. We did that dream chalkboard in the hallway. And I've loved just pondering over that. Last week, the elders gathered together. We prayed over your dreams. We're just so excited about the dreams that, that God is, is birthing in our hearts. But let me just show you a couple, right? These are the dreams that you have. Let's see if we've got these. Save 460 million people. I, now, I don't know where that number came from. It's, it's like, let's, let's do America and Canada. No, you know, I don't know. But I love that you're thinking big. You're thinking, that, that's a huge number, right? 460 million people. That's so, so huge. It's not big to God. He loves them all. That's right. Okay. A couple more. For all my children to be saved. Let's see the next one to have my whole family worshiping Jesus together. Is that fantastic, right? So these are Peter's dreams, it, it, sculpted by Christ, right? Peter's dreams originally were for Peter to be a governor uh, in, a, in a kingdom where Jesus was the king and it was Israel and it was super hot and muggy in the summers, right? That was Peter's original dream. He offered it to Jesus, Jesus sculpted it. And now you and I are included in Peter's dream. Not only that, but we're invited to dream the same dream and to offer our dreams to Jesus so that he can sculpt our dreams and use us to impact our world. And so right now, I, I would love to have you grab the card that was in the connection, uh, or the connection card that was in your handout. And on big days like today, we shoot for 100% participation. I would love to include every single one of you, uh, your card in this. And, and if you have prayer requests, we will pray over them. We do. We have teams that are committed to that. But what I want to encourage you to do is fill this card out and then take a next step. And if, if you have never said yes to Jesus, if you've never trusted him with your life, with your dreams then I want to encourage you to take that step today. I want to encourage you to, to mark that first box, or if you're recommitting yourself to him, mark that second box. But that third fill-in, that, that third um, opportunity, I want to encourage every single one of you to check, and that is that you would be willing to trust God with your dreams, and that you would say, God, I'm, I'm going to offer you my dreams so that you will sculpt them and shape them, and you will use them to not only bring my best, but bring your greatest glory. Okay, and so as the offering bucket's passed, you can drop that in the bucket as it comes around. What I want to do right now is I, I want to pray. And I want to ask that God would be present right now in your deepest dream, in that glorious haunting that you keep coming back to again and again in your life. I'm gonna pray that that place would be the place that you invite God into today, okay? So let's pray. Jesus, you know our hearts and you know where we fall short and you know where we, where we hold on to our own dreams with both hands because we're afraid to let them go. We're afraid to offer them to you. We're afraid to trust you that you will sculpt them in such a beautiful way such a powerful, such, such an adventure-laden way. We're, we're afraid. And so right now, Lord, we just ask that you would come into the place of our deep dreaming, that you would find that we are now willing to release that to you, that you would sculpt and that you would hone, that you would chisel, that you would mold our dreams so that we would see your glory made manifest through us, through our lives, that, that we would live a life of incredible adventure, that we would propel ourselves from this dynamic tension of being content in you and being discontent with the world in which we live. And so we are now agents of your kingdom, and we are available to do whatever it is that you call us to do. Lord, we love you. 
And we give you our dreams, we give you our lives, we give you our hopes, it's all yours. And so we ask that you take it for your glory and lead us into the life, the best pathway that you have for us. We pray it in your name, amen.